my name is Ken Holder. I was born near a town in the Texas Panhandle, uh, well, born between the towns of McLean and Shamrock, which probably doesn't, isn't familiar to very many people. Uh, it's east of Amarillo, about 70, 80 miles. Uh, when I was four years old, we moved into Amarillo, and um, um, I lived there until I left for college. And I can think of any number of things about being in that place at that time that have affected and influenced almost everything I've done artistically, I think. Uh, part of it was just a, a kind of an attachment to to the land. Um, you may think that's funny if you've ever been to the Texas Panhandle and it's flat and dusty and tumbleweeds and not a whole lot to see, generally speaking. But uh, as the um, editor of the Amarillo newspaper wrote sometime not long after I had moved there with my parents, uh, there's a story about God creating the world in seven days. And, and he worked the first six days and uh, got tired and he decided, well, I'll, I'm almost done. There's that little piece down in, there in that southern part of the globe that isn't finished yet. It's just clay and stuff. I'll just smooth it over. And uh, tomorrow, tomorrow when I get up, I'll um, make it valleys and mountains and streams and like the rest of the world, make it beautiful. And the next day he got up and he looked at it and that clay had just turned to hard rock, cliche. He looked at it and started to work out. He said, this is too hard. He said, I'll just, I'll just make people that like it this way, which is kind of, kind of true. Uh, uh, Part of, part of my proof of that is that uh, there was an air base in Amarillo years ago when I was growing up through high, junior high school and high school. And uh, most of the people that, most of the, the military personnel that were there, stationed there, were from the Northeast. I don't know why there were a lot of New Jersey people for some reason. But it was amazing how many of them got down there and spent two or three years living there and got out of the Air Force and just stayed because because they liked it. And so uh, there's something about the there's something about the I don't know the sky and the air and the, the just the atmosphere that I always felt really attached to the earth. And part of it had to do with um, the breaks that we got away from it, going up into New Mexico and the mountains or uh, to Colorado and I was uh, in awe of that landscape then in contrast. And uh, so it, I, when we would go, I would uh, pay particular attention to the landscape. I'd make sketchbooks and carry them along with me. And, and as we drove in the car, I would make drawings. And then when we got into camp at night, I would color them in with my colored pencils. And so. Okay, um, I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, I was born there. I went to public schools there. Uh, after the uh, high school, uh, I had always intended to go to college. And uh, I had a teacher that encouraged me. Um, I had been pretty I'd been quite sick in my senior year in high school, and uh, I was kind of short a few credits, but I had been a good student, I guess. And uh, for reasons I had never thought about it, but she was saying, um, there's aspects of our art program that you are better at some things, and not particularly others. And that made sense because it was, a uh, the particular program was a commercial art program. And I didn't like doing all of it. And, uh, and she knew that. She said, what I think is best for you, because we are, you've got, well, I was in the band. And that gave me enough 
of my missing credits. Um, so that then I was eligible to go to college. And, uh, and she said, I think, you might, I think you might give some thoughts to becoming a teacher. Uh, and I had never given that a single thought. And she said, I have a really good friend that's uh, head of the Department of Art Education at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. And um, just if you're thinking about going to college and where you're going to go to college, uh, you might give uh, a little thought. I, she's a good person, and I think she would give you some good advice. And uh, talk to your parents and see if you could go down there and, and meet her. And she gave me all the information. So I did that because I hadn't selected a school or anything. And uh, my parents said, well, we know you want to go to college. Go. They bought me a train ticket. And uh, I went to Lawrence, Kansas. And I did look up the woman that the high school teacher had suggested I talk to, and I did. And uh, she said uh, something you should know about our uh, art education curriculum and program is that your first two years are going to be in the School of Education. Um, and then the last four years uh, for an undergraduate then would be all art classes. And that's just how we do it. So it's two different deans as it is administrated by the university. So I thought I would tell you that first. So at a needing advice, I, I started in and, uh, and did that. However, um, I, after my first year, I took a turn to um, the commercial art program. And that, wouldn't, that wasn't a surprise to me because my high school had that same program. So I thought, well, that's the only art program I have as a background. So I curved over into that program and found that I hated every minute of it. So, okay, in my sophomore year, uh, having then gotten to the so-called uh, art program generically, then I got an education that I had never had before. So I went all through the primaries, many drawing classes, painting classes, and, uh, and by the time I was in a junior status at school, I got very interested in printmaking. And though I had continued to take painting and drawing classes all through the latter part of my years there, uh, I really decided that I really wanted, at least as I went, if I went on to school, I would do so as a printmaker. And I did that. I was born and raised in Detroit, which uh, some pe people tell me is uh, kind of a surprise because I'm pretty much, I think, known as a, uh, an artist who is inspired by landscape. And uh, Detroit was not a place where they had a whole lot of uh, this kind of landscape. They had plenty of factory landscapes. And I grew up in Detroit and worked in factories and worked... Uh, as a clay modeler for the Chrysler Corporation for a while. And, uh, but uh, Detroit and I somehow uh, didn't get along real well. I knew it wasn't a place I wanted to stay. And after I graduated from Wayne State University as an art major, uh, that, uh, and then went into the Army, and uh, I wound up with a master's degree from Michigan State, also as an art major and, and a painter, that. Uh, uh, that I got <clears throat> came went out to Los Angeles and got my first teaching job after I completed the PhD at Ohio State University, and the PhD was a studio degree. It was, uh, and I feel that's when I really became an artist. Was uh, a three-year program. It was solid and straight through, and uh, and they 
uh, I feel <laughs> taught me an awful lot about what painting is and what art's all about. My mother uh, grew up in the town of McLean, which is near where I was born, which is, I guess, why my father ended up there. Uh, she, she had, she'd gone to school. She had a one semester of college before, uh, I think before the depression came along and kind of ended that route for her. She was a very talented person. She was, a, she was basically just a housewife, but she had all kinds of uh, skills uh, that had to do with uh, what in those days we might call women's art, uh, sewing and embroidering and quilting and you name it. She could, she could do all of those things. She'd grown up doing those things, working uh, in groups with other women and girls making stuff and she, she had a good sense of taste and a really good eye and, and a lot of skill. And I think that had a lot of influence on me as well in terms of, of quality uh, concerns and, and so on and respecting things of, of beauty and purpose and function. Uh, they were all very supportive though because uh, as I said they appreciated the options I had, they were, like most parents, I think they were concerned when I got ready to go pursue it that uh, it wasn't something that was going to pay. They were, <laughs> how are you going to make a living? Uh, kind of questions that were always there. Uh, but they, they, never, they never gave up on that. And they they int uh, continued to int uh, encourage me and support me. And when I got in, I know when I went to TCU for my undergraduate studies, I, uh, I'd gotten entry because of one of my high school teachers who had been a graduate there and he had gotten me in school and taken me down and uh, through the fine arts department had gotten me a, an assistantship uh, through the dean who was a personal friend of his. And uh, I went down there and accepted it and it was They'd run out of assistantships in art, so they gave me an assistantship in theater. I was working doing, working backstage, doing sets and stuff, or learning to do it. And uh, the first in the first month of game, and I didn't get a paycheck. They said, "Well, you put your pay towards your tuition," which I still owed on. And and my parents, although they didn't. I don't know where they got the money, but somehow they came up with the money. My dad was very principled about that. He said, if a man works, he ought to get, get, he ought to get paid for it. And so he, they came up with the money to pay off my tuition, so I could go ahead and finish school. And that became, uh, that, was, that was a really significant uh, thing for me because I knew, I don't know where, I'll never know, I guess, where they came up with the money to do that with. But somehow they did, and we got through the first year. Uh, so they were always there in, in, in great support and encouraged everything I did. And, and they were, not that they weren't baffled sometimes, especially when I, I got into graduate school and my work began to become a little more uh, unusual or a little extreme or radical or whatever. And they weren't really quite, quite sure what they had paid for or what, what I was doing and why I was doing it. But uh, they never lost faith, I think. Well, when I, when I came back from Germany, I got out of the Army and I spent the summer at my parents' house. I contacted some of my old university professors at TCU and asked their advice about graduate schools. And they gave me some, you know, A plus and C plus and few in between options to pursue. And I applied to four or five universities I got rejected from nearly all of them because I was way over my head, having not made any art for four years. And I, you know how it is with graduate school, they want to know what you've been doing and what you can do. And I, I, I really didn't know what I could do because I hadn't ever pushed anything to that point. So uh, I wasn't surprised, but the Art Institute 
at that time was not in very good shape financially, and I think they were taking just anybody that applied. <laughs> and so, so they, they even let me in. And uh, I got up there, and, and the, the, the two years that I was there, the school was kind of, uh, it, was, it was kind of a disaster. You wouldn't know it with the reputation they had before and the reputation they have now. But at the time, they were in really sad shape. The, um, it had started as a school, and one outgrowth of the school was the museum. Well, by this time, the museum had gotten so large and so successful that it was the tail, the tail wagging the dog. And uh, they weren't giving anything to the school. They were giving them just barely enough money to get by. Um, they were housed in the same building as they still are. One of the best things about that situation was that proximity of the museum to the school because uh, five minutes from any classroom, I could be in the middle of the museum looking at the real stuff. And that was, I mean, you can't imagine for me at that point uh, how significant that was. I was just a sponge and I would, I, I would take an apple for lunch uh, most days and maybe a sandwich, bologna sandwich that I'd eat, make in the morning and take to school with me and they'd eat in a big, they had a big cafeteria there. And that's what most of the students did is bring their own lunches. I don't think they served anything in the cafeteria. It was just a place to gather to eat. <clears throat> I'd eat my apple and then I'd take off for the museum and I'd spend the, most of the hour of the lunch just walking around looking at things and exploring until I got to know the, everything in there pretty well, pretty thoroughly, I think, from uh, uh, having that advantage. Plus going in every day, the only way to get in there was to go in the front door and all the way through the museum. So every day going into school and coming home, coming back from school, I had to go through the museum. So. Uh, I could take different routes or see, maybe just see the same thing every day for days in a row until it kind of became part of my, my environment. Uh, the school itself, because it was so starved financially, uh, didn't have a particularly vital fac uh, faculty. Most of the faculty were People had been students there 20 or 30, 20 years before, say, and had been the top students. And so they got, they used to award the students a year travel in Europe uh, after their degree. And uh, so most of, these, most of the instructors I had were people who had done that, who had gone through that, had gone to Europe, come back, had got hired to teach when they got back, and they'd been there ever since. And um, they were good and they were challenging and interesting, but uh, I have to I have to say I don't think they were the, the most inspirational uh, teachers I ever had. They were just kind of I think they most a lot of them they were getting kind of tired. Not all of them. <coughs> there were a few distinguished ones that uh, um, made a strong impression on me and and encouraged me a lot in terms of. Um, thinking about what kind of teacher I might be or want to be when I got out. But it was, it was uh, all, all in all, it was, a, it was a positive experience for me and it was uh, a timely one, I think, for what I needed, which, is, which was the exposure and the time also to, to do what I wanted to do and to kind of pursue my own uh, thoughts. Uh, but I did get a job there and I helped Ken with his, he had a scholarship, uh, but it helped us live and pay for our apartment and, and um, gas. He had to drive into to, um, uh, his classes, but he was a graduate level, so he could do a lot of work at home. He did most of his painting. We kind of set up the living room to be his studio. And um, had a, he, he made our sofa and it's kind of like Danish modern, you know, he made the platform. And then we had his mother make the 
uh, upholstery, so you know it was comfortable and you know it's kind of like handmade stuff. His mother was a um, she made uh, curtains and drapery for people that lived in Amarillo. Um, she was she was probably the premier uh, drapery maker of this this giant store that sold uh, all kinds of material. The people I feel most indebted to as an, as an artist that, uh, who kind of clarified for me what art is and what it ought to be and could be is one, one was when I was at Ohio State working on the doctoral program, there was a teacher named Hoyt Sherman. And someday he will, he's written books and had something called the Flash Lab and where you drew in the total darkness. And, uh, and they flashed a big image in front of you and you had to draw that in the darkness with chalk on big paper. And it was amazing after a while how much you could retain, how much you could get down, and how much you could really feel the space. And to this day, that's how I, I can feel it in my arms and elbows when I get it right. And, uh, and this was a 10-week program we drew for one hour every morning from 8 to 9. And uh, it was a lecture before that. And then we had these total darkness. I mean, there wasn't a bit of light any place. And they flashed this thing in front of you, you had to draw it. And then after the, the lights went back on, it would, with the group, you had discussed the drawings. And it was incredible. At the end of 10 weeks, they were very individual drawings. They were, you could see the handwriting. You could see everybody's progress. And, and I've always remembered that. I always still feel when it's right, you can, you can feel it. And, uh, and, and so, but the difficulty there, this was all in black and white chalk and uh, charcoal. And, but as to getting it into color, and Hoyt Sherman, he could talk about color, but he still he had a difficult time trying to translate that into a flash lab or trying to uh, move beyond it. And, uh, and I left, but uh, the, I graduated, and, and he hadn't achieved that quite yet. But he sure could point it out. And, uh, and he's the one that told, I, I really learned what color is all about from him. That, uh, and so when I went to uh, <coughs> California, that, uh, and California is a place where one sees lots of color, and it was a very exciting place. And, and, uh, and I began to try and bring together both color and figuration. That's Cezanne's classic problem. And, uh, and Cezanne influenced me a great deal looking at his art. And how do you get figuration and color together? Uh, uh, <clears> then <throat> together mean to be mutually supportive instead of uh, divisive. And <clears throat> the uh, and so that was the problem. And I have a big painting still upstairs that I did in 1962, trying to get figure and color together. And uh, it's, you, can get, you can get color just by splashing color around, but that's the old abex thing, abstract expressionism. And the, the deal in, by 1960, when uh, <clears throat> de Kooning suddenly started doing the Pink Lady series, which he'd started in 52, but by 1960 he was moving. It was like, uh, de Kooning, how could you move from just total abstraction? But he was making figurative, and if de Kooning did it, so did I. And, and, uh, and so that was by 1960, I was really trying to get figuration and color together. And he sense I'm still doing that. That's just what I do was, uh, you know, keep going, trying to get uh, color and figuration to be mutually supportive and, and to offer a whole spatial understanding that's structured by the color forces. And, uh, so when I got here, that, uh, that there was some people who are I still very friends and who are basically have been friends for all these years, and uh, whose art, I, I, that's part of what brought me here, was their, their art, which I, when I was interviewed, that I was shown. And, uh, and one was Harold Boyd, who's just, he's a master draftsman. He's, he's uh, as a drawer, he's just, uh, I, I, I think he's, maybe the best around, not just around here, but uh, he's right up there uh, with uh, what our drawing should be. Uh, in my um, printmaking in the undergraduate program that I mentioned, uh, the real nucleus of the importance of that was I had not been trained in those basic art programs. I had never had a a drawing class in my life. And I thought an artist 
has to know how to draw. That was about the only uh, thing I had to do was to become competent at drawing. So the printmaking was essentially, I knew enough to see this is a graphic media. And so I could, because I had worked and worked and worked at drawing. So I made them match each other in my latter work, in my MFA work, and my graduation then. And so after graduating with an MFA degree at the University of Kansas, I looked like others who thought teaching was something they might want to do. I started applying to schools for positions, and to make it short, uh, I sent my materials all. I had heard that Illinois State University was expanding uh, many, many programs and lots of uh, fresh uh, people to fill the population that was growing. So I got a position here teaching all the drawing classes that Illinois State University taught in their curriculum. Many, many uh, years was focused eventually after the beginning with a lot of life drawing. But I actually started the print program uh, about uh, around 1968. All right, Macomb being a very, very small, small town, um, um, when Ken got the job here at ISU, I thought we were moving from that tiny little town to a city like New York City. I mean, it was like huge. And the whole idea of coming to, you know, not, not that I had not lived in a big city. I'd lived in Fort Worth. Um, Midland was an up and coming, even though it was out there in the middle of the Permian Basin. It was uh, kind of like a small Dallas. Um, I was so excited about moving to a town that had more than one theater. <laughs> and, you know, a university town. It was Twin City, of course. Um, but yeah, that was a, a big move.